Yeah, welcome everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. The topic of today's lecture is debugging, profiling and performance analysis. And our lecture eight will really bring all these terms together and we build them gradually. So we will see that we start with debugging, understanding that one, and then we will learn that this is probably not enough to really understand large parallel programs and to debug them or basically to get a better understanding of the communication behavior. What we also consider as a whole process. So that idea of tuning an application in parallel computing is quite loaded. It has many steps. It's a complex endeavor and in a way never finished. When you port it to a new HPC architecture, you can imagine that of course there will be perhaps new performance uh, problems arise and, and so forth. But before we go into the material of this lecture, let us shortly review what we learned the last time. The last time was really in lecture seven, thinking about hybrid programming. And we learned that this mostly is referring to the idea of using OpenMP, so shared memory, together with MPI, so distributed memory. You see that a little bit here on the top left, where essentially we use OpenMP with shared memory within a node. And then in order to communicate across the node, we use MPI basically also to, of course, enable much more scaling. If you think about Peta scale and exascale today, we hardly could do this just with one node. So we have to go basically to the other nodes in order to leverage really the technology. Questions were arising if that is always so smart to combine OpenMP with MPI, right? So you have to have a really good application setup. We learned the last time it's not so easy as one would think to do that. So we thought about different ways how MPI could be used. If you remember, there was a task mode and a vector mode. And we said the vector mode is much more cleaner because essentially it just gives you a very, let's say, good way of um, differentiating the OpenMP code from the MPI code. It is better readability. Of course, you have here and there some drawbacks. You see essentially this complete overlapping of communication and computation is a little bit not possible. But still, you have lots of benefits, much better understanding, essentially, your parallel application. And if you really are for tuning, if you really want to get the best out of the performance, maybe task mode is something for you. But this also means you have to have lots of experience. Your code will be not as easy anymore. And it takes maybe lots of time to really tune it and debug it. Hence, today's lecture is also about debugging and tuning. So this is, of course, a follow on topic of this. If you really want to do OpenMP combined with MPI, um, you basically need perf performance and analysis tools, parallel performance analysis tools. You see MPI, as you remember from our last lecture, can be used on different areas. This should explain essentially a parallel region of OpenMP. You could say that the MPI is just called by the master thread. Um, this is an important part, or is it eventually called by some parallel thread at some point in time? So you see, essentially, this gets quite complicated to really then understand, okay, we have the master thread. It spawns several threads, and one of these threads at some point in time will then do an MPI operation. And of course, there should be a counterpart MPI operation as well, maybe a send and receive or the broadcast from others. So immediately, you can come point uh, come to the point that this is really a complex endeavor to do this hybrid programming. However, we see essentially that this is uh, quite something what we often do in parallel, you know, applications and codes. We have our HP debut scan example where we had uh, again and again throughout the lectures now and now finishing with this one here in this lecture, the idea of thinking that MPI uh, basically on data set one had limits. And when you experience this, that your scalability of MPI tails off or breaks, chances are you maybe can get a bit more performance out to do a hybrid, basically, implementation like you see here for DS1 stands for data set one and data set two here. But we do MPI and hybrid here com and compare them together to really see that there's quite a margin that you can gain. However, at some point in time, it probably also tails off. We also know that you steer a lot of things then in parallel. So when you think about a job script, we have said now we want to have different nodes in order to use them with MPI, as we said above. 
So two notes would be meaning exactly this, right? So that I go here between the different notes. But then, of course, I have to think about also what's happening within the note. So what tasks to execute, how many tasks I have per note. And this is, of course, something to consider. Now, we, we also said then another idea of hybrid programming these days is also the use of accelerators. Right, you think about CPUs, here is where OpenMP and MPI are playing, but GPUs and accelerators, that's where CUDA code is executed, kernel function, things which are not obvious to you, and we see that how that materializes when we come to our next lecture, lecture nine then, after this lecture today, where we do basically GPUs in detail. And the idea is essentially, instead of just using the CPU and then offloading everything to the GPU and wait, you see, waiting is a very bad word in parallel computing. Idle resources, as you already remember from one of the earlier lectures, this is not good. It could be used by someone else. And in this sense here, you think like before the CPU can continue, the kernel has to do his job, his GPU, maybe a tensor operation, a deep learning network, whatever it is, you really use the kernel for. And once the kernel is finalized, you continue then with the serial code of the CPU. So the idea is then really to do hybrid programming in this sense, that you use a CPU, maybe with MPI and OpenMP code, and then in parallel the GPU by offloading with CUDA kernels, and use basically both of these devices in parallel. This could be very smart, and in a way contributing to this execution time reduction here. Um, of course, this is a more recent version of hybrid programming, People, when you talk to them, mostly will refer in HPC rather to the OpenMP and MPI one. But more recently, of course, this idea comes basically more and more into light of calling it hybrid programming as well. Then in the more interesting part, then later on in these lectures also where the idea of patterns, there we had the so-called stencil method or stencil pattern. If you remember where we said each of the grids need the same information from all its neighbors, so it reflects about nearest neighbor communication. And essentially you could have a heat application with a, let's say a heat line in basically somewhere in a pedestrian walkway here in Iceland. And you want to calculate our, how many time steps essentially this heat is distributed in the earth or let it be a room, whatever it is, it's computed. The key message to take away is that many of applications follow this pattern. That's why it's a kind of design pattern for HPC. But on the other hand, it's of course not a design pattern like software engineering with factory patterns or so. So here we're talking more what applications are incredibly often using. And one key ingredient is not only the nearest neighbor communication, which shares some complexities. If you remember the need for hollow regions, if I may be at the end of a node here, then I have a ghost cell or hollow regions here to be filled with parameters. And the reason is that in the next time step, right, I need this information. And you see that here a little bit illustrated with T0 and T1. So that is the time that I have, right? Time step zero, and here is time step one. So when I compute here time step zero, I have to say that that's fine, but for the next time step, before I compute this, I not need not only my time T0, I need also the values that I have from time step zero from all of my neighbors. And these neighbors could be, as you see here in 2D, up, down, left and right, but could be, of course, also a broader neighborhood relationship, including the diagonals. But the key message to take away really is that we have to find a system, a mechanism, a pattern to really store the variables in a way twice because they have a life in the next time step where they are required for compute. In other words, when you have this hollow regions, you have a kind of fake domain part, which is just there so that basically these fellows here could be computed in the next time step without waiting because the, best, the idea is really to fill this hollow regions after each iteration so that in starting in the next iteration for the compute intensive part, you would have these values already existing. And also this is a pattern. We have seen this in some of the earth science applications. We will also come back to in later applications where again, the idea is to do MPI across a node. So you cut the domain in different blocky parts. Within the domain, you can leverage short memory, OpenMP, 
but always basically have some whole hello regions here to communicate then with MPI in, in the iterations, the different values that you need basically to, to um, use for your computation. Right, and this was an interesting complex um, lecture, lecture seven. So I think uh, you would agree with me that really to do OpenMP and MPI together is something probably that really just the experts should do once they really are fully understand OpenMP and MPI. And still also think about, especially today in exascale systems, it's getting more complicated and larger scales. The question arise, does it need to be OpenMP, right? You could also do basically MPI to scale high and essentially then see that that may be enough to scale up and maybe even better to scale because then the application impacts that you require in terms of programming, in terms of performance analysis time and so on, you have to invest could be quite cumbersome. So in here and there people also recommend not only open MP within the node, but maybe just the pure MPI um, implementation to really scale up. Good, so this was really the repetition of lecture seven in a nutshell. Let us come now to the lecture eight, which is about debugging, profiling and performance analysis. This is also a theoretical and conceptual topics and of course becomes really relevant when you have, let's say, large scale codes. We will here make some small examples, which of course then have to be think, thought of, um, okay, maybe this can be easier debugged, but uh, take away the message when we move towards beta scale and extra scale applications, really lots of computing is used. You as a normal human cannot really understand all of the different communication behavior, especially when you jump between different HPC architectures, between different HPC systems. So we start a little bit by the origin of debugging. What is this? What mean all the different terminologies like profiling, wax? Um, what is the debugging idea? Then we look a little bit on advanced debugging techniques and tools we really need. We really quickly come to the idea that doing this all by hand, adding printf statements, is might be not the best way of doing it. We will reflect on some of the performance terms just to understand the importance of what is really a paralyzable part right, of an application. And of course, when you think about a performance, you want to measure something, we want to make it measure time for execution or time to execution, time to solution. So this is done by the wall clock time. And you remember this a little bit from scheduling. That's why we will make, also make a link back here to our scheduling ideas we had earlier. I show you some interesting MPI timing approaches um, that essentially are a very trivial way of doing debugging and profiling. But we will also see then more advanced tools for profiling, which really capture then the essence of um, essentially what is a key ingredient later of the performance optimization. So you would say that profiling in a way is really a requirement more or less for the performance optimization. And one of the reasons is that the, the idea of doing this in a large scale today is mostly using so-called tracing techniques. So you basically let the compute uh, compute and the communication happen, you trace them, and later on you have an output that you can really analyze, that you can understand with a maybe uh, interesting visualization. And then you really have some performance measurement metrics um, that are actually valid for OpenMP and MPA the same way, and can actually detect patterns. Patterns where you essentially, again, have bad performance behavior, let's say a late sender or a broadcast where one of the broadcast members, if you remember, this is a collective MPI operation where lots basically are already executed, but one is still, let's say, um, waiting, right? And it's doing some other stuff, not entering broadcast yet. So there's a waiting time. Hence, we will also review in many of the different examples, these waiting times again in the second part of the lectish. Now, here, there are some interesting programming examples as well, like using the right MPI collectives, which is sometimes tricky if you have a for loop doing MPI broadcast all the time. Maybe an all reduce or all gather or whatever it is, what you want to do is basically better than, than doing these things. So we will review this a little bit, that loops in, in context of MPI collectives could be a bit tricky and perhaps actually exchange with more smarter collective operations. And here and there, we have some hardware dependencies that we just want to shed a light on. 
in a way, we see we fulfill many promises. And again, of course, a lecture like this within the university here is not going to such a full detail that you would have usually in one of our centers. If you have a HPC center like Barcelona or like Munich Supercomputing Center, Munich, they would have really teaching courses for three, four days from morning till evening, how you actually cope with Scalasca. They have tuning workshops, scalable or scaling workshops where you really analyze the behavior of your scaling of your MPI or OpenMP application using Scalasca, using Vampire, using different, let's say, tools to really analyze the behavior of the HPC application during the runtime. And once that's understood, you can here and there really tune and get lots of good um, ideas out, especially if you have these trainings together with, let's say, experts in this area. So some learning outcomes related to this lecture is clearly um, the idea that you basically uh, have more complex aspects of parallel programming understood. You see now basically that here it's all about tuning, debugging, making the code better, right? Not just um, implementing it that we had previously. Now it's really getting the, the fine tuning. And of course, there should be some tools that really support us in this endeavor. And we will see there's quite a big fraction of tools available. We will analyze them a little bit. But with those tools today, you have already, let's say, the major tools in high performance computing like Scalasca or Vampire is very much known. Um, that is both basically a cutting edge inter technology. And of course, they rely on some other smaller tools like Score P, for instance, and so on that we also will cover in this lecture. And once you have learned about this, of course, and you really seriously com programming parallel computing, then I would encourage you taking one of these tutorials, which is really three, four days to really, you know, go into the really fine tuning. But you have essentially all the tools that are required to handle all levels of complexity and parallelism. You just have to take the time to do the tracing. You need the computational core hours, of course, to do the tracing, to replay, to look at your parallel application, tune it, refine it, and again run it and see if it basically was better now. But in the end, you learned basically everything in terms of tools that you require to really fine tune here the applications. Let us look a little bit what debugging really means. And it's interesting when you think about the origin of this debugging, why is it called debugging? Uh, this is really that the moth was found once in a computer. So, and actually the people were saying we are debugging and it was actually stopping the Mark II supercomputer at Harvard at the time from computing. And this is actually the first real case where this bug word is actually found. So basically you can trace it back to this. More formally, it's of course a methodological process of finding and fixing problems, flaws in software, right? And of course for us here of high interest is parallel um, debugging. That's why we start a little bit with serial debugging, but then, then we quickly go to parallel computing debugging, which is much more complex. Examples you already know from hopefully some of your own programming um, exercises. So one is, of course, buffer overflows, wrong pointers, out of arrays, not initialized variables um, that maybe do wrong things. The code complexity as such, as a whole, um, there are many of those examples, as examples that really justify uh, that debugging gets an own word because usually when you are programmed, the program never really works the first time. So you always go back, you debug, you see what did I wrong and then you compile again, rerun again and so on. Of course, this is not directly tuning yet. This means just you want to have it running and want to have all errors, flaws, problems removed from it. But still it captures already the essence, of course, moving the first steps towards tuning. So then, um, when you think about parallel programming and basically the, the expertise in it, you would say that really there are a lot of many tools out there. It is significant number of courses around there that really are, as I said earlier, already scaling days. If you look here in the phrase um, training repository, for instance, you find a large collection of trainings, really what it means to do parallel performance analysis. What does it mean to do parallel debugging? Some terminologies, which maybe all of you some know already a little bit. So here you have a deadlock, for instance, uh, illustrated, which is actually quite easy usually to understand. You have just one processor in the time. Uh, 
that is, you know, doing something like sending maybe something over time and thus is waiting essentially to, to get process three something back. But this has already happened before, but essentially we are waiting now for something which happened earlier, right? So they all wait for each other now because they both expect an answer, but it probably never comes. So the strange situation in this deadlock is really, as the name suggests, it's a locking in the mode that actually nobody can further compute or f finish the operation. And uh, this can be detected. Of course, in this example here, you see clearly, let's say um, you smell a rat when you see these arrows, right? Um, but of course, now think about that you don't have just five pro processors. Think about that you have a very, very large parallel program. Then you cannot really identify all of this manually so quickly. So you need automated tooling. Another idea of where essentially we will have some tools for today is the race condition. So you remember from shared memory programming, if you have a shared memory variable and different threads at the same time, more or less actually go to this and write into the memory without, let's say, having, you know, a protected serialization here or basically a parallel region which is specifically protected, then you could either come out with the x equals one or two because one will overwrite the other one. So it's a race condition across basically four variable x here. And this is, of course, a problem as well. So again, debugging now from the terminologies is really finding the error in the code, why it's not working. And of course, we need it and to fix it and to find these errors in order to have a correct program. And this could be lots of different examples that we already said. And what we really can learn from serial programming is that essentially you use very similar techniques, right, that you um, basically use for parallel programming. So essentially to prevent bugs in the first place, you would say you apply good software engineering principles like check error codes, continuous integration servers these days, robustness checks. And of course, a good parallel code readability would be a good idea as well. So that refers to something like really good function names, good variable names. Um, the units of variables should be kind of clear. That's often overlooked. Um, the purpose of inputs and output descriptions of functions. So really a proper description of metadata really towards your code. Of course, everybody knows who is programming. These are things which are often overlooked. And in this sense, if you have a more and more complex uh, code, a more bigger program, especially in parallel programming, you tend to do more errors and bugs. And of course, it makes sense in this context to also review the idea of so-called version control systems like CVS, SVN, Git, etc. that is around there that really helps also to prevent some bugs by really having old versions, not just simply copy pasted, but rather in a proper way, um, basically used by having this version control systems. So if you don't had contact with these systems in the past, I really encourage you to um, look into this. Of course, we cannot handle this basically as part of this course here, but it's really a fundamental software development um, tool today. Then if you think about um, the code structures, you can imagine uh, make it a bit modular, not really all one big block, rather implement functions, implement different modules. And so the, the interesting thing is that we um, can apply these software engineering concepts, but many of these parallel codes are basically um, not really up to this and have not implemented these approaches. So you will find the heavily physics codes very tough to understand. Of course, we should remember that we have in this bug prevention also an HPC complex environment. So we have this interesting idea of this code change, compile and run trials. Right. Um, so that gets more and more infeasible. If you have, let's say, a hard, large HPC system, you have a scheduler, you execute a script and you have to check. Is that the right script? Right. You can do something like which program name to check if it's really the right path name. Let's say the HPW scanner um, implementation that we have seen. Is it the right one that is called the right version that is called? Then implement usually stepwise. Right. Don't do as you do now also with your ocean simulation here and there. Don't do all the ocean simulation at once, right? Write maybe a little bit parts of serial codes when it runs perfect, go to the small 
basically the number of processes and then always expand. Start with one boat on the ocean floating around, then two, two boats. Then start with the communication with the captains. So basically increase the complexity step by step. Um, because otherwise, if you don't do it stepwise, usually with a big, large parallel program, you will fail and the debugging is very painful. Then you have um, essentially uh, many libraries that actually also have existing codes and it also, of course, makes sense to use those when they've proven also the test of times. Now, when we think about what some of you are already doing as part of our assignments, and I think that's partly okay because we have smaller MPI applications, so it's just naturally to do so and everybody has done it, I guess. Right, so print F statements, um, you want to have, a, let's say, the code so-called instrumented, right? So you put your own print F uh, statement, you want to have the rank and say, oh, what is actually this process doing, what this particular rank? And then basically um, the easy adjustable output, you can do whatever you want with this output, which makes sense. You can put the output of a variable, the, vari the value of a variable, but of course, this is again really error prone and time consuming. If you think about you're still changing the program all the time. Um, you're also not sure if really the bug is found. Um, you will add printf, you then compile it, do your analysis and then remove it again. So in the end, um, you have lots of lots suddenly in the source code in comments and it's essentially really um, is, is basically very hard to do. And then basically also the outputs vary. If you remember the timing when you have outputs of different ones um, as basically again a race condition to get the screen right the right basically to one output file um, not to the screen to the output file and this means serial and then basically you come to the fact that this is not deterministic this output and then really get lost in all this debugging. So printf is really just for small programs that's what I'm getting to and if you think it'd be here after many advantages, you know, you can see that these advanced debugging techniques, you see an example of one, uh, the DDD debugging open source GUI tool with an OpenMP example. This works quite okay because it's shared memory, so we stay within one node. And you can directly see you have control over your source code, go step by step. You have so-called breakpoints. You can see values of different threads in different variables. So using the graphics already um, and stepwise going through for debugging helps you enormously instead of just, you know, doing printf statements. So I encourage you, of course, to think about this advanced tools. Um, GUIs might be sometimes slow from practice because HPC systems tend to not being very good in GUIs or basically have to channel them through SSH minus X3, X11 forwarding. Still, it's really worth the effort. So let us go through a couple of debugging tools. You have here the GNU debugger, for instance, that is a basic debugging, uh, really basic, um, which is then also available as Eclipse here. You see Parallel Tools Platform. There's another open source um, debugger, um, which has a whole development environment and basically has also similar features here and there to do, let's say, very basic debugging. However, if you want to have really cutting edge tools, um, you have to think about commercial tools, and this is loaded. I know that even some of the um, interesting, let's say, centers in Europe, they even have not all of them too many of these TotalView licenses. So it's a very powerful tool, TotalView, but it's also a costly tool. But you immediately can see the functionality here um, by really understanding source code, which thread uh, going over to really interesting, um, let's say, uh, I ideas how it is here with the communication patterns. This is all a very nice tool, but unfortunately, this is also really dominated by commercially expensive software. Another one here is Alinea, and we will also in lecture nine review some for the GPU domain for NVIDIA, for instance. Now, when you use open source debuggers like GDB, um, they work in a quite interesting way. Um, now, also think about the scalability here is, of course, limited. It requires lots of manual work. You see here one example of, let's say, a typical application here. Um, what it does is not important. Important is that it gives out the PID. And once the process ID is known, the idea of this GDB debugger is essentially 
um, to attach right to this GDB debugger this executable on this process here 4711 as an example. And when you do so, you essentially get a little bit an overview of what's happening to this particular process. So you see pr one process. Now you can imagine already in the illustration that I had before was, you know, five processes that would be already, you have to attach five times, you know, kind of the, the GDB in different, let's say SSH terminals or windows, um, essentially to this processes. And this is of course quite some cumbersome, um, idea to do. Hence, when we think about more the commercial perspective and here this commercial total view tool, this is of course completely different. If you have lots of MPI ranks that you see here, for instance, communicating widely, you quickly get lost and you don't want to actually have here in this example with 16 processors, um, you don't want to attach GDB to 16 processors, right? This is already a lot of work. So also the functionality is, is quite powerful, as we already said a very powerful GUI with lots of functionality. The different elements um, of this tool, not only does it support different programming languages, of course, it has also multi-threaded debugging, a distributed debugging, and what is also quite interesting is this memory scape, which is a memory debugger, right? A bit like Valgrind, I come to in a moment, but of course here also very strong and powerful to understand memory problems in your uh, application that are maybe segmentation faults or any other things. So let us come, however, now after this debugging, now to the more idea of profiling to aggregate statistics. And these, st these statistics then would be important for us to really understand what are the time consuming segments in a power program. So, and this brings us then as an input, so to speak, later to the performance optimization steps. But before I optimize something, I have to have a, a kind of uh, yardstick, if you want, right? What I want to measure against when I optimize. So that's why we need profiling. We need to measure what's going on. And this could be in different function, the program, what takes the most time um, and where are there problems. And of course, you can imagine this goes deeper and deeper, what type of function. So in a way, it contributes to the idea that we basically see here that you're never finished. We have a certain optimized application or we developed an application. We do the measurements we using profiling, do the performance analysis, and then do some tunings in the code. But then you will realize perhaps then they could optimize somewhere else in the code. And then you do measurement, performance analysis and tuning. So long story short, it's an iterative process where you basically have, of course, good chances to do performance increase, but also you can essentially always optimize in the way, especially if you now think about different architectures that you have or the use of CPUs and GPUs on top. Also here, scalability workshops are of course an important part of this to really um, be successful in this. Just if you remember from lecture three, a little bit coming back to some essentials, even do tuning and even do measurement time that means you have different times. You have always, let's say one is the application. You have a serial part and a parallelizable part, right? So this is of course the one that's interesting for us. And the S parts here, are some examples where the algorithm doesn't work, let's say in parallel, or you would have shared resources. Uh, IO devices are often a good example. You have certain startup in overhead when you, for instance, use basically initialization phases of parallel programs as MPI init and so forth. And then some elements of communication might be that you cannot use them as parallel. But the idea is really to think about the following, that you have this kind of idea with parallel performance and a fixed time problem. You have the zero part, which you can basically not really tune a lot, but to work on the tuning and the basically measurement times, firstly here to then understand much better what's happening here. Of course, here and there, we also understand the zero part, so we can see what's happening. And this also differentiates us now because for us, it depends on the factor N. So how many nodes, how many CPUs are basically there to, parallel, to break the parallel part to smaller pieces. I don't have this in a serial world. That's why a serial performance analysis is much easier. When you're now thinking about benchmarking and taking the time, the measurements of such a program, you already heard a little bit from earlier lectures about the world clock time, so the elapsed time. Um, basically only CPU time would be not really fair because you have lots of things that contribute to it. 
like the I/O time and so forth. So in the end, basically, also it has some relationship with charging for core hours on large HPC systems, and basically um, lots of other imparts, important parts, which is important for really being in a production HPC center today. So understanding the workload time that's important. And it's really the actual time that is taken for a complete program. And this not only includes a pure compute, it's IO time, it's a communication channel delay, like for instance, an MPI. So it depends, of course, on the application. Here's an example how you would also use it to report, of course, on the scalability, right? This is a smaller support vector machine application. And it shows you over time here that we break down the performance with 16 processors. And this is essentially here from the scheduler. You see always we have basically allocated just one node and it took 17 minutes in the wall time. Then you see we broke it down to 10. If you have two, then we basically leave us four to seven and so forth. So you use this time, of course, to measure if it also makes sense to apply more cores, to apply more nodes to the problem. Um, this is one way how you measure and why you measure this, right? So you see here a simple MPI timing function that you can use for this. Essentially, here's the MPI program. You would have time one and time two and can use the MPI uh, W time for it. That really has the elapsed wall clock time of a parallel program. And then, of course, you can perhaps put in a printf statement or so forth. Now, when we think about the MPI profiling interface, this is already one step ahead. So you have a kind of a menu replacement of MPI routines um, that is possible. And essentially you call in your program anyhow MPI send, right, which is your normal source code. But the profiling ex uh, interface now enables us to, let's say, have a kind of wrapper routine for this, which automatically then calls a profiling interface instead of the real MPI send. And from this, you can do interesting things, adding on the measurements, and that exactly is what the optimization and the performance analysis tool later actually use. So here's a simple example. If you want that you implement an MPI send here, uh, which is your own wrapper function call, but it really in the MPI um, profile interface here, there you basically increase a counter, for instance, or whatever you do and basically can, can, for instance, measure how often this was actually sent. And your real segment with real code, right, uh, will not change because you still still have MPI sent to call, but inherently it will take leverage of this when you link, of course, also then the profiling library and so on. And this brings us basic understanding how often a specific MPI function was already called. There are several profiling tools. Valgrin is one optimized for memory usage. Vampire is one which is really also tracing together with Scalaska, really the number one programs if you want. There's interesting timeline views of programs. So is, how is really the execution going? And Scalaska has the added value of having also patterns that we will review in the second part of our lecture a little bit more in detail. There are several commercial tools for tuning, also in the area of GPUs with NVIDIA tool sets. But the tracing um, is really the idea then to build on top of profiling and collect all the information um, about the program for the analysis afterwards. And this is essentially then profiling all the aggregate st statistics that you have by via this profiling available. And basically, you see then beautiful tools like this, where you have really then Scalaska here with one cube analyzer. Um, where you have the report of the analysis and you can see there's a late sender and even maybe identify certain patterns we will actually reveal. But you have an idea how the topology will actually look like. You see exactly the timing, where's the most time spent in which of the, let's say, source code flow of the whole parallel application with, of course, color indicator. So you know which problem um, is faced and where in the problem it is and which processes of the HPC machine are somehow affected. Of course, very powerful technique. We will look into the second part into the lecture much more deep into this. Um, Ballgrind is another one. It's also open source, an instrumentation framework, again, that you would like to really use when you have, let's say, memory intensive problems, when you want to detect some memory management problems. It's also good for cache grind, so cache profiler, if you want to 
make some you know specific tunings around this so this is another example just of this tool that we cannot go into the whole detail here but what we can do is to show you a little bit the vampire open source uh, tool that you have available here you have here the timelines you see here the 16 ranks from an mpi program and then you see the runtime here where mpi broadcast was basically there and the whole tool set how you can actually um, tune and basically make breakpoints, see a little bit about the bigger picture of your parallel performance here. Um, and then I think a very good example now is really thinking about total view. I'm not working for this software company, but I think really it's a very strong tool. That's why we will look at a video shortly about this. It is also available on YouTube because it also captures essentially the essence of all the different tools, making breakpoints, analyzing variable states, different parallel threats in action. So let's go to the video shortly before we stop with the first part of this lecture and then continue with the second part. Hi, my name is Bill Burns. I'm the Director of Product Development and Product Manager for TotalView. And today I'd like to give you a quick introduction to TotalView and I'll just do that through a demo of a debugging session. So I start a total view here, and we can see the interface on this. You're presented initially with a nice start page on here, which will direct you to how do you want to start your debugging session, if you're debugging an individual application or maybe a parallel program. Total view is built from the ground up to debug complex applications that are utilizing multiple threads and multiple processes at a time. In this case here, I'm going to debug an application that uh, will have multiple threads within it. So let's debug a program. I'm going to browse off and load my program here called Thread Workers. I don't need to set any other options at this point, so I'm just going to load the session. Here's my source for the application. And let me just start running the application on here. So this application is going to launch a GUI, so let me give a little room for that. And I'm going to hit go. So this is a QT-based application that's going to simulate four threads doing work and then feeding a GUI thread with information on the results of their work. So if I hit start here, we see the threads working and providing information back up to the GUI thread. So let's halt the application with total view. And we can see in my process and thread view here an overview of my application and the five threads within it. Right now we're focused on thread 1.1 in the application. I can look over to the right to see where it stopped in the call stack on here. We're deep down in some system calls. I can refocus up to main to see that uh, where we went through and into an exec routine on this. I can change my focus to any other thread by just double clicking on it. And I can see where those threads are. Again, they're in some system routines. I can go up to where there's code that they're executing as they're doing work. The power of total view really is focused around being able to manage complex applications with multiple threads and processes. So I can go through and, uh, and go from high levels of either controlling groups of, of processes or threads, or, or I'll go all the way down to an individual thread. So let's run an individual thread here. So I'm gonna change my focus level from group all the way down to thread, and I'm gonna run this one GUI thread on here. So this highlights a feature with our process and thread view here, where we're showing an aggregated state of your job. So in this case, it's the threads that are going, and I have four threads that are still stopped and one that's running. Imagine an application with tens of thousands of either threads or processes. Having an aggregated display will allow me very quickly to see what's going on with my application. So uh, let's focus on another thread here and run that thread. And what we'll see now is that that one thread is now feeding information up to the GUI thread and as they're running going through. Now, of course, with an application and a debugger, you want to be able to control it through big breakpoints and so forth. So let's halt again. And we're focused on one of our threads. And let's just set a breakpoint in some code up here. So we'll go up through, just scroll up a little here. And I can set a breakpoint on a line, say, 51 in here. Now, by default, breakpoints are defined to a process width, which means when it's hits, the entire process will stop. But I can change that to, say, a thread width. So let's go through and change that to thread and then run my application again. So in this time, I'm going to change my focus to the whole process. And I'm going to run the process and go through. <coughs> 
Now we can see that my one thread, thread one, two in here, stopped at that breakpoint, and everything else is running, and we see everything updating my application on here. So uh, again, this aggregated state is very important to see the, the state of my job that's running out there. Uh, my action points view down below here shows me all my different breakpoints that I have set. TotalView has the ability to put evaluation points in, so you can, you can run a bit of code at a particular stopping point in your program. You can also put watch points in that will watch memory, and if that memory changes, stop the execution of your program. And finally, we have barrier points for synchronizing processes and threads. On the right, we can look at local variables that are in the application and drill down into data structures and examine the data within those. I also have an advanced data view that I can look at data and structure data through that as well. TotalView has some advanced features along with it. We have a reverse debugging engine that records the execution of your program, and you can deterministically go back through that execution. Just like you're going running forward and hitting breakpoints, you can do all the same in reverse. And it's a very, very powerful feature for finding bugs and also learning code. So this has been a really quick overview of some of the features in TotalView, some of the different aspects of the user interface on here. To learn more about all the capabilities of TotalView, please visit perforce.com and check out the TotalView page. Okay, that was a short, um, basically, in illustration of using the TotalView, of course, for a very specific part, but at least it gave you a little bit, hopefully, the idea where it's used for. We break here for the, third, uh, for the first part of the lecture and we will continue in a couple of minutes for the next part of the lecture.